Good morning to everyone. We're going to begin in just a couple of minutes, but we're glad you're here this morning. Well, we are at the top of the hour. An official good morning to those of you who are joining us live, those of you who are watching or listening to uh, this recording at your leisure. We are, of course, recording live, and uh, it is October 9th, which means that it is the fourth and final session this morning of the Fall 2023 Aging with Grace series uh, that we're putting on here at the Hope and Healing Center through HHCI Cares. My name is Seth Stander, and I serve as the Community Aging Specialist for CARES. CARES can be described through the acronym Caregiving, Aging, Resilience, Ethics, and Spirituality. And CARES is directed by Dr. Peggy Dettermeyer. Now, as I mentioned, each of our four sessions uh, of Aging with Grace each season uh, are recorded and slides will be made available to registrants following our series. Each of these sessions are part of CARES mission to serve our growing aging population and the growing population of caregivers who attend to them. Now, in addition to uh, focusing on community education, Dr. Dettermeyer and I offer consulting with special emphases on the hopes and challenges of aging, uh, with navigating the journey of grief, with bioethical concerns with the, with the living. We are located, the Hope and Healing Center and Institute, on the campus of St. Martin's Episcopal Church here in Houston, Texas. We're a separate 501c3 organization dedicated to meeting the psychosocial and emotional needs of the entire community near and far. And thanks to some generous underwriting and a, a very robust and talented philanthropic department, uh, HHCI is grateful to offer our programming to you free of charge. So let's go ahead and make our way into this session, Paying for Aging. And I'll say right from the get-go that this is an overview of available options. By no means is it exhaustive. Uh, we do want to give you a general background of, of how many folks pay for aging in place, aging in long-term care settings. And so we encourage you to speak with financial planning professionals for specific details on how these options best apply to your specific circumstances. So what we're going to cover throughout today's session are in general, the costs associated with aging, a description for the uninitiated in, in regards to Medicare and its various parts and the various parts of Medicaid. We're going to talk briefly about what type of private financial options exist to help pay for the costs associated with aging. 
and we'll have a list of resources, which of course will also be available to you in the slide deck that registrants will receive following this presentation. So let's first talk in general about the costs of aging. Most people will pay Medicare premiums, Medicare deductibles and co-pays, and drug co-pays. And if we're talking about a relatively non-complicated aging in place uh, experience, one can expect per Health View Services, one of the resources at the end of today's slide deck, couple that is 65 years old today, over the next 20 years or so, can expect to pay roughly $400,000 in today's dollars uh, for various services. Now, when I talk about a relatively smooth aging process, we are also taking into consideration besides wellness checks and uh, the increasing use of various types of medication as warranted, but perhaps of medical events scheduled or unscheduled for which a return home is uh, uh, most likely expected. In other words, what we're not including here are the costs of care facilities, short-term or long-term. And for those of you who joined us for last week's session, uh, Understanding Living Options, uh, you can refer back to that presentation's recording or slides, uh, which for those of you who uh, are concerned about accessing, I want to reassure you, if you go to our webpage to hhci.org, you click on the Resources tab, and you will find our current series will be placed there in short order, but also we like to keep at least the last series of Aging with Grace uh, prior to the most current in our archives as well. And you'll find that substantively, the data may change a little bit, but the core principles do not. So if you need something in a hurry, we encourage you to go through that archive, which is in reverse chronological order for various resources. So when we talk about the average monthly care costs for those who are in need, of continuous care, most likely because they have a need for assistance with activities of daily living, at least two or more of them. And we'll go through a complete list again in this presentation of those various activities of daily living. But imagine all of the tasks that we generally take for granted when we are well. Everything from being able to rise out of bed safely to ambulating to the restroom to emptying our bladder and bowels to being able to clean ourselves uh, and being able to go ahead and to get dressed and get on with our day. All of these activities, in addition to being able to respond to unexpected or emergency events, fall into the category of, of independent living, whether you are doing so in your own home or whether you have chosen to join a community in which you are under one proverbial or literal roof and you are enjoying independent apartment living uh, on the same property as others. In any case, should you need assistance with, usually the standard is two or more of your activities of daily living, these are the average monthly care costs, as you had a chance to see now on the screen. They range rather wildly when it comes to home makers or home health aids. And we discussed last time the difference between home care, which is non-medical care versus home health care, which re requires that the, 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 the service providers be trained and certified in various clinical uh, areas. 
everything from being able to assist you with your activities of daily living, uh, to monitoring your health, to helping you prepare and administer medications if needed, and the list goes on. We talked a little bit last time about adult day health care. Primarily, we put it in terms of the type of adult day care that exists for those experiencing the beginnings of or are in more moderate stages of decline due to dementia, Alzheimer's or other related dementia. Moving out of one's home, and even out of an independent living setting and into different types of licensed assisted living facilities, the next two categories listed here talk about standard assisted living facilities and the personal care home model, which if it has four or more beds is also licensed as an assisted living facility and the costs related to that per month. And finally, whether one goes to a nursing facility because skilled rehabilitation or wound care or IV antibiotic therapy is available there, or whether one makes a nursing facility their long-term care destination. And in both the cases of assisted living facilities and nursing facilities, there will be provisions in most places for memory care units that are secured you're looking again at the price 7200 and above these range wildly when it comes to parts of the country and the amenity associated with the facility and all of this we're talking about are the out-of-pocket costs not the negotiated costs that per for example if one is financially or medically qualified for Medicaid services that permit paying for nursing facility care long term, in which case a negotiated rate between the facility and Medicaid, when coupled with your monthly applied income, usually your Social Security income or other type of pension, civilian or military, these are where ultimately you pay for your stay and your care. So let's talk for a few minutes about the differences between the types of Medicare and the types of Medicaid that currently exist in the United States. First of all, in terms of funding, understand that Medicare is a, a, a primarily a federally funded program for those who have either aged into it by achieving the age of 65 years old and above, uh, or for those who have been designated as disabled and are able to go ahead, therefore, and access Medicare benefits. Whereas Medicaid, is primarily a state-funded program with support from the federal government. However, after the Affordable Care Act was passed some years ago, states had the option to either opt in or opt out to post-ACA Medicaid expansion. And I imagine that many of you who are watching this live or uh, recorded are here in Texas, but there are states that accepted post-ACA Medicaid expansion, but Texas doesn't happen to be one of them. So that means the pot of money available for the different types of services that Medicaid provides, which we will get into, are going to be more limited because expanded federal dollars were not accepted by Texas's current state government. Qualifications. In order to qualify for Medicare, uh, you or your spouse will have needed to pay into the Medicare system for a minimum of 10 years. Whereas for Medicaid, um, you have to demonstrate limited income and, and severely depleted financial resources. And the definitions of what makes for limited income and, and, and financial resource depletion differ on a state by state level. So what we'll be speaking about in, in upcoming slides are Texas's numbers 
They may look identical in the state in which you reside, if it is not Texas, or they may differ slightly. But just as Texas Health and Human Services administers Medicaid for the state, your state's equivalent of Health and Human Services on the state level um, is, is going to be your best uh, source of information in terms of what the qualifications and distribution levels are for the different types of Medicaid benefits that are offered. So Medicare, as some of you may already be intimately aware, consists of four parts. Part A, the general hospitalization part. There is no premium for this. However, there are uh, deductibles uh, and ultimately, those deductibles will add up the longer you are in a hospital. Part B is what is referred to as your major medical coverage. This does have a sliding scale premium and what it covers we'll describe in just a few moments, but think of it as everything outside of hospitalization that one might need, whether continuing to recover from a, a scheduled or unscheduled medical event uh, in your residence, however that is defined. We're gonna skip over to part D for a second and, 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 and remind the, those that already know, but inform those who may not have yet the opportunity to know that part D is what is referred to very often when we discuss prescription medication coverage. And that premium will depend on the type of plan that you elect, the enrollment periods or qualifying life event periods that allow you to change these enrollments become very important times for you to go ahead and to speak with such groups as your county or territory's area agency on aging, aging and disability resource center, uh, and with your team of physicians uh, as, as examples of people who can help best guide you with regards to what type of Part D plan is going to best cover the majority of your prescriptions. Now, we know a lot of things are in flux right now with the government uh, recently gaining the ability to negotiate directly with uh, pharmaceutical companies and the first 10 major medications uh, on that list, which is not on these slides, but I encourage you to go ahead and to Google that list. It's been in the news in recent weeks. will only continue to expand uh, as the months and years pass. So ultimately, you may see a difference not only in medication costs, but perhaps premium costs as well, as ideally those costs of medications are lowered through direct negotiation. Now, now let's return to Part C. Part C is what is known as your Medicare Advantage plan. Part C, or Medicare Advantage, is designed to replace Parts A, B, and D. And the premium will depend on the plan and those plans will also come with different types of primarily HMO style benefits, perhaps additional benefits that allow for vision coverage, dental coverage, and more, depending on what you choose. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about that as well. So when we talk about Part A Medicare, we're talking about, of course, anything related to hospitalization and the immediate aftermath of hospitalization, which is to say, what happens after you're discharged. The acute care hospital stay is going to be covered, again, deductible supply. And then depending on where you go after discharge, if you are not headed directly back to your residence, whether it is your private home, an independent living setting, or a long-term care setting, uh, we have usually three options. One is to go to a long-term acute care hospital, uh, which is referred to as an LTAC. And that usually 
occurs when you have further need of, say, IV antibiotics, or you have severe wound care that needs the type of attention that long-term care, acute care, uh, long-term acute care hospital staff, I should say, are capable of delivering. There is typically a 60-day lifetime benefit for this particular service, but again, we're not going to go into maximum benefit information at this level. Certainly, your area agency on aging can be of benefit to you in describing it in greater detail. An inpatient rehabilitation facility, or an IRF, is another post-discharge destination where, as you can imagine, the focus is on, um, and it's not an either or, it can be and both, uh, when it comes to physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, when it comes to, for that matter, speech therapy, and so forth. Now, here's the key. Beyond it being a focus on the different types of rehabilitation therapies, you have to be able to withstand three hours a day or more of this therapy. I've talked in the past about two to three hours because the reality is, is that these facilities want to work with you to the best of your ability. Uh, but the technical minimum is three hours. If you find yourself slipping below that and closer to the two hour range, you're gonna wanna have a care plan meeting to, dis to, to try and discuss A, why that's happening, and B, what can be done to maximize your endurance for the various therapies you are scheduled to receive. Now, we've put in here as the final discharge category uh, the skilled side of nursing facilities. As you've heard me describe previously, um, this is, by my estimation, um, the last resort option that you should take. If you can accomplish your short-term post-discharge goals in either a long-term acute care hospital in LTAC or an inpatient rehabilitation facility in IRF, I strongly encourage you to work with hospital case management and with your physicians to make sure that that's what's prescribed upon discharge from the hospital. This is not to say as I've mentioned previously, that the skilled services typically contracted by the nursing facility, whether they are long-term antibiotics, wound care, rehabilitation therapies, et cetera, aren't good. In many cases, they're quite good. But the staffing shortages in nursing facilities make the ability for general staff to get you up, cleaned, dressed, fed and ready to partake of especially three hours a day or more of therapy, um, there, there, there are problems when it comes to delivery of said services because facilities are chronically understaffed. This is something that was not only exacerbated during the pandemic period, it was never remedied. So that's something to keep in mind. Please don't accept if if case management comes to you and says, you're going to location X, and you ask what type of place is location X, uh, and ultimately it comes out that beyond the skilled services provided, it's also a nursing facility, please don't accept that as your, as your first choice if medically you qualify for either an LTAC or an IRF instead. I would strongly encourage that you go there unless you are, and here it does make sense, if you are returning to perhaps the same nursing facility where you are already a long-term care resident and will benefit from the skilled services that are, are prescribed to you upon discharge. There are certain circumstances in which, you know, if that is already your home, returning to your home makes sense. But even then, you may want to go ahead and see whether an LTAC or an IRF on your way back to that nursing facility makes more sense. Now, it's important to note that there are other Part A Medicare coverages 
uh, that, that include not just aggressive care, but also comfort care. Let's talk a little bit first about comfort care. And by comfort care, we're talking about the umbrella that is known as palliative care, which is primarily symptom management for whatever is ailing you, whether uh, or not it is something you can recover from or it is considered uh, a, a, a terminal or, or, or otherwise um, non-fully treatable condition, which is to say the best you can do is manage it, not cure it. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you in fact have a terminal diagnosis for which the prognosis is six months or less of life, one of the elements of palliative care is hospice services. Hospice services, which primarily are residential based, although there are under specific circumstances in patient units, if you qualify for such level of care. Um, ultimately, regardless of the type of palliative care that you receive, whether it is by being enrolled in hospice or whether it is a palliative care team uh, that is added to the overall interdisciplinary team, that is managing your care and condition, please understand that this is not 24-hour care with the exception of, say, an inpatient unit in hospice, which the vast majority of those enrolled in hospice will not partake of. They will be in a residential setting, however their residence is defined, whether it is their private home, independent living, or long-term care. That's the comfort side. The more aggressive side is the home health service. It is, depending on why you need it, either covered by Medicare Part A because perhaps you entered the hospital for the condition for which post-discharge some type of prescribed therapy is warranted, or it may be that it's covered under Part B, your major medical coverage, because your, your need for home health care services uh, is due to, a, 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 let's say, an unscheduled event that required emergency room care, but not admission into a hospital. And upon returning to your home, still, home health will benefit you because of the services that they provide not just therapy, by the way, for home health, but also um, limited amounts through home health aids of personal care. What they both have in common, regardless of whether you are admitted to a hospital or not, is that regardless of which part of Medicare covers them, you do need to receive them at home. In other words, home health is not coming into an LTAC and IRF. If your home is a nursing facility or an assisted living facility, they will come there because that's your residence. The other piece that's important to keep in mind is that there is no double dipping of services allowed by Medicare, which is to say, if you are enrolled in hospice, receiving skilled services um, or receiving home health services, will require you to unenroll from hospice first because the understanding of the qualification for hospice is such that if you need aggressive care for any reason, then according to Medicare, you would not need to be in hospice receiving primarily comfort care. There's a reason, though, that palliative care is a large umbrella. This is not to say that you would stop receiving symptom management. The medical entity responsible for providing it would change if you elected to unenroll from hospice in order to receive more aggressive care services, such as skilled clinical or home health. 
continuing to talk about the eligibility for Part A Medicare. There is what is known as a three midnight rule. In other words, um, in a hospital, you need to have stayed for three consecutive midnights in order to qualify for a skilled part of a nursing facility stay. If you have ended up spending three consecutive midnights in the hospital's ICU, then upon discharge, you are eligible for LTAC services. If you have not been admitted, in other words, if you are there, even if you're there for a night or two, but not formally admitted, in other words, on observation status, this ultimately it doesn't qualify you to go to either a skilled nursing facility uh, or to an LTAC. Having said that, inpatient rehabilitation facilities don't make a distinction. It's part of the reason why I said talk with your case management when it comes time for discharge, regardless of whether you were formally admitted to the hospital or not, your inpatient rehab facility eligibility remains unchanged. And if that's what brought you there, then perhaps that's the best place for you to go before you go to wherever home is. Another thing to consider is if you're not ready, for whether you qualify for either or both skilled services in a nursing facility, um, for that matter, LTAC uh, services or an inpatient rehab facility, but primarily we talk about an IRF or a SNF after an acute care, in other words, a hospital discharge. If you say, I'm gonna try it at home first, maybe with home health, and it is just not happening. You have a 30-day window post-discharge to get yourself admitted uh, into an IRF or a SNF, that is to say the skilled side of a nursing facility. Um, if in fact you have tried the home route and despite the skills and the timeliness of the various clinical services coming to your home, it's just not working. You're finding that you're not improving the same way that you would if you were receiving round the clock staffing. The last thing to keep in mind is that all of these coverages um, and there is up to a hundred days of coverage per event. That coverage limit gets restarted so long as there's been a 60 day or more break between hospital stays um, for the same condition. Now, it's important to say because let's say that God forbid you're taken to the hospital because you've had a heart attack and ultimately you're going through some type of therapy, you go ahead and you make your way home primarily for that therapy, but while you're home, you slip and fall and break a hip. Again, God forbid it should happen. These are two separate events. So keep that in mind, that we're talking about two separate reasons under a 60-day window, um, which means ultimately, we're really talking about two different 60 day breaks, if you will, uh, because the heart condition is one event and then the broken limb, or in this case, the broken hip is another. If it's simply one event, then a 60 day break needs to occur in order to reset your full eligibility for benefits for Medicare. Um, it, it, it's something to just keep a careful eye on as God willing you recover and, it, and it's never needed, but but we we're, we always want to talk about the just-in-cases. Now, uh, this will change, ultimately, by the time we do our spring 2024 uh, uh, sessions on Aging with Grace. But as of today, these are the current Part A Medicare co-insurances, your deductibles and co-insurances, I should say, depending on the setting involved. So the inpatient hospital deductible maxes out at 1,600 per visit. Your daily co-insurance for days 61 through 90 um, ultimately comes out to $400 a day. And your lifetime reserve days 91 and above, which goes up to another further 60 days is 800 per day. 
if you were to be discharged to a skilled side of a nursing facility, your coinsurance would be $200 a day for said services. Now, what's important to keep in mind as far as that last category is concerned is that Medicare will cover at 100% through days 1 through 20 of, say, being discharged to the skilled side of a nursing facility, for that matter, also to an LTAC or to an inpatient uh, rehab facility. And starting with days 21 and above, up to day 100 of max coverage post-discharge from a hospital, that's where you're going to begin to see out-of-pocket deductibles uh, uh, coming into play. Although there is something referred to as a hardship exemption, which is to say, if you are paying your monthly mortgage note or rental note for your primary residence, and you can't afford to go ahead and to add daily uh, uh, coinsurance uh, out of pocket for anything day 21 and above of your stay, you can apply for a hardship exemption, in which case uh, it is typically covered through Medicaid dollars, assuming that hardship exemption is accepted. These are things that you would want to discuss directly with the facility offering you care if it looks like you're going to go beyond 20 days of coverage. Time to move into Part B, major medical, if you will. And this is everything outside of a hospital setting. Your medically necessary services and supplies, preventative services, your labs, outpatient visits, scans, and other forms of diagnostics, outpatient medications, including any injectables or infusions, and you'll note I put here in parentheses, some DME, the acronym for Durable Medical Equipment, which can be replaced every five years. This includes such things as bedside commodes, Strangely enough, it doesn't include shower chairs, although you'll find both available at your local Walmart or Target, uh, et cetera, uh, at, at reasonable costs. It also includes ambulatory equipment, although you have to choose one or the other. So if you are in need of some type of a wheelchair, whether it is a transport chair or one that you wheel yourself, you can't also have Medicare cover a walker or a cane or so forth. Um, keep that in mind as you go ahead and you figure out what you want covered. Odds are a wheelchair or a transport chair is gonna be more expensive. Um, the other option available to you is to go ahead and to look into rental of such things like wheelchairs or transport chairs, um, which you might want to get out of pocket for and then have Medicare cover a walker, a cane or other some type of assistive device for ambulation. In any case, these are all considered, as I, as you see right at the, the above, medically necessary in terms of services and supplies that ultimately you're going to have prescribed to you. Everything that is related to Medicare has to be prescribed in order to be considered for coverage. So communication, with your physician is going to be a regular, ongoing process. Talking for a moment about those home health services that are covered by Medicare. Again, whether it is covered by Part A because you're coming out of the hospital, Part B because you were never admitted to the hospital or at least officially not admitted to the hospital, here's what is generally covered part-time or intermittent nursing care by or under a registered nurse's supervision, the various therapies we've mentioned, home health aid services we've mentioned. What's important to mention also is that medical social services are now going to be accessible to you in a way that parallels if you were hospitalized case management in the hospital. If you were not hospitalized, those social services are there primarily to ensure that you are aware of uh, how to access and if you need assistance, 
accessing the various services you are entitled to based on your age, injury, or both. We've talked a little bit about the types of supplies, and ultimately, um, there is no limit to these homebound services that, that uh, when it comes to especially physical speech or occupational therapy. Now, those who provide those services may attempt to claim otherwise because they get paid less as more time passes offering you said therapy. It's important for you to understand that um, advocating for yourself, and, and that includes getting your doctor and the area agency on aging involved, is, is a crucial part of reminding, shall we say, um, I think that's a kind word, reminding those companies that are receiving less and less reimbursement for their time uh, as, as, as your therapy continues across weeks or months, um, that uh, there's no limit. So long as you continue to qualify for their therapies, they're to provide them. As far as what the law authorizes, Anywhere between 28 to 35 hours per week of, of home health aid and nursing services combined. Again, all of this is prescribed. Um, if you wish to try and engage home health aid services for personal care, or as I mentioned earlier in this slide deck and in the previous presentation, last week's presentation, home aid services, non-clinical assistance out of pocket, God bless you. Uh, but Medicare is only going to cover anywhere between 28 to 35 hours combined of aid and nursing services under the umbrella of home health care. So keep that in mind as you try to figure out what you can do safely on your own, what requires the assistance of professionals, and where you can receive the assistance of people in your social circle, family circle, and more who may or may not be trained, but may very well prove valuable in their very presence by preventing, say, a slip or a fall. So, monthly premiums. Um, if you happen to be somebody who makes, either individually, after we modify your uh, your, your adjusted uh, gross income uh, uh, for, for, your, for your taxes, um, if you happen to make more than $97,000, congratulations. The numbers on the monthly premium side are important to know, but odds are you're going to be okay paying those premiums and still maintaining the rest of your household budget. For those who fall into the category of earning less than or equal to $97,000 individually, and again, the numbers in terms of filing taxes jointly are there for your convenience as well. The monthly premium cost of $164.90 may or may not change in 2024. That's simply where we are as of today's presentation. Um, keep this in mind as you work on your household budget. Uh, I think it's a good idea, regardless of what you make or what you have saved, to always keep a careful eye on your household budget and your savings. But what this has to do more with is making sure that you can continue financially to safely age in place if that is your current goal, or if you have uh, noticed an increase in your spending because you have opted for independent living, senior living, uh, long-term care of any form, assisted living or nursing facility care, um, and you are paying out of pocket for those because of your lack of financial eligibility, shall we say, for Medicaid for nursing facility stays. Uh, you're gonna wanna keep a very careful eye on this because you're spending down your savings at a much more rapid rate as a result of your living conditions. Again, based on your health needs, do what's best for you, but recognize, of course, that your budget is going to continue to be impacted. I'll only speak briefly about Medicare Advantage plans. Again, 
what's known technically as Medicare Part C, and ultimately Medicare Advantage plans are designed to replace entirely traditional Parts A, B, and D of Medicare. In Harris County alone, there are more than 60 plans with a range of premiums and deductibles and maximum costs. Also, said plans have various limits, inevitably, on covered doctors and hospitals. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Chronicle uh, reporter Lisa Falkenberg has done various uh, series uh, over the years on aging and and the costs related to care in general. Uh, and a couple of those articles are referenced uh, towards the uh, end of this presentation and will be in the resources links uh, that, that are, are, are the end of this slide deck. As I mentioned before, dental, vision, hearing, some of these Medicare Advantage plans have coverage, supplemental plans within that, that, that cover these. That's wonderful, but also recognize, again, is that worth the trade-off on perhaps limited coverage when it comes to doctors and hospitals? These Advantage plans very often have some flexibility in terms of offering in-home supports and modifications to your home in order to help with aging in place. Which is to say, if your plan is to age in place, there is something worthwhile about investigating the differences between Medicare Advantage plans and traditional Medicare Parts A, B, and D. If, however, you find yourself in an assisted living setting or a nursing facility setting long term, traditional Medicare has customarily provided more robust coverage than a Medicare Advantage plan because by its very nature, it is designed for people aging in place rather than electing for a congregate setting. So keep that in mind. It does not, this does not mean uh, that, that on a case-by-case -case basis, you may find a Medicare Advantage plan that is more advantageous to you even though you're living in a long-term care setting. It just means there are trends and be careful when looking at those trends, especially when marketers for Medicare Advantage plans come around assisted living facilities and nursing facilities and go ahead and start saying things like, hey, wanna save money every month? Well, it's possible that you'll save money each month in terms of premium costs, but it's also possible that some of the other things that traditional Medicare is covering for you, that Medicare Advantage plan will no longer do so. If it's no longer important to you, fire away. If it is important to you, you might want to consider just smiling and saying, I'll think about it. Medicare Part D. Ultimately, this is going to be uh, uh, changed as of 2025, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Um, in 2025, all retirees' annual drug copayments are going to cap at $2,000. So that's effectively going to go ahead and end the coverage gap or the donut hole. Certain parts of it were closed already as of 2020, and so, therefore, when you enter the coverage gap, at least right now, you're only typically responsible for 25% of the cost of your medications during that donut hole or coverage gap period uh, during the year. Um, essentially, as I said, in 2025, this whole provision is going to disappear because of the way the Inflation Reduction Act has handled this particular area that has been rather thorny for people on limited budgets seeking prescriptions of varying types throughout the year. So let's talk a little bit about Medicaid. Medicaid is primarily funded by the states and the federal government. And as I said before, it's up to the states to decide how much federal government assistance they're going to receive. They are administered by the states under federal guidelines, 
And ultimately, they're designed to go ahead and provide health care coverage for low income adults, for children, for the elderly, for the disabled. This all assumes medical qualification and financial qualification. Traditional Medicaid is going to therefore uh, go ahead and assist in coverage just as Medicare would assist in coverage for various parts of home health services, DME, again, durable medical equipment, infusion care, parts of hospice coverage. The HMO style Medicaid is very often what we think of though, when we think about such things as getting through referral and pre-authorization, durable medical equipment for long-term use. And when it comes to the kind of services that ultimately the skilled side of a nursing facility and LTAC and rehabilitation, whether inpatient or outpatient as administered by home health, uh, provide to those in need. These do work together with their counterparts in Medicare. Again, it has to be prescribed and you need to be both financially as well as medically eligible. Here are some concerns when the most important part of Medicaid when it comes to long-term care is considered. As I mentioned, once one becomes financially qualified to receive Medicaid coverage for long-term care. Here, long-term care means nursing facilities. Sad to say that assisted living facilities do not take Medicaid. Ultimately, that remains an out-of-pocket cost for you. And so if your applied monthly income is sufficient, terrific. If you medically qualify, though, for a nursing facility, as opposed to an assisted living facility. And financially, you have the caps that are listed on this slide. Again, these are the current 2023 caps. They may change in 2024, which is ultimately having an individual income cap of $2,742 a month. That also, in addition to that, means that you have a financial asset limit of $2,000. We're talking about liquid, checking account, savings account, et cetera. We're not talking about irrevocable funeral trusts or funeral plans. We're not talking about your house or your car when it comes to Medicaid eligibility consideration. However, Texas participates, as do a number of states. A number of states don't participate in this, but, but Texas does. In what is referred to as MERC, the Medicaid Estate Recovery Program, which is to say pulling Medicaid benefits now means the state reserves the right to try and collect off of the remainder of the estate that wasn't touched, the house, the car, liquid the liquidation of possessions and so forth after an individual's death there are legal remedies for this exemptions that can be claimed and ultimately we want you to talk to your area agency on aging and as you've seen in previous slides uh, throughout the aging with grace series remember we spend an entire session on legal concerns related to aging so ultimately, the resource slides that are available there, which you can see either in the recordings or more likely you're going to have copies waiting for you in your email inboxes. So please keep eyes out for those if you haven't already received them. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so ultimately, I'm going to do a brief overview of long-term care criteria in Texas. Again, you're in a different state, your mileage may vary. But what we're talking about ultimately is something that routine care by an untrained caregiver at home would equal disaster. Um, wound care, peg tubes, managing someone's progressive dementia, evolving psychiatric needs, etc. Um, you've got a condition where nurse supervision is required. 
where you've got cognitive and or visual deficits that demonstrate that you cannot take care of yourself. Um, when a physician says that you are absolutely eligible and in fact should be in a long-term care facility of some type, these are all what is required when it comes ultimately to having Medicaid in terms of medical eligibility. Financial eligibility on the previous slide, we've already gone ahead and seen how limited your income has to be, which is why if you have substantial savings and ultimately see yourself uh, unable to exist anywhere outside of, say, nursing facilities, you're going to do a spend down of your liquid assets until you reach the financial as well as medical threshold, and then you can apply for Medicaid services. So what are your financial options? And you're gonna find on the remainder of the slide deck that there are going to be descriptions of each one of these. Um, but let's talk about them for the next few moments before we go ahead and look to the chat for anything that might be out there by way of comment or question. First and foremost, your personal savings. Now, that's gonna be a combination of your monthly applied income and whatever you've managed to save in terms of investment, all the way down to what's in your checking account. If you are able to age in place and stay on the right side of your financial ledger, and if it makes sense from a quality of life standpoint to do so, God bless bringing services to you, bringing community to you, bringing family to you. As I mentioned in the very first sessions and in subsequent uh, sessions of Aging with Grace, this is what over 80% of people want, is to age in place and, and do so in a way where their income and their current savings level are not outlived. Fantastic if you can accomplish that whether by yourself or with the assistance of family members. Long-term care insurance is exactly that. It's going to cost you roughly $2,800 plus a year to go ahead and to end up with roughly, uh, I believe, somewhere uh, under $200 uh, uh, um, a, a day of, of coverage for whatever type of long-term care stay you are in, be it assisted living or nursing facilities. That is fantastic in terms of lowering or eliminating the cost of, of being there, but you have to continue to pay those premiums. So that's, of course, a factor to keep in mind. Short-term care insurance is exactly that, which is to say it's a lower premium and it's designed for covering those co-pays, those deductibles, the out-of-pocket costs that are associated with stays in LTACs, inpatient rehab facilities, the skilled side of nursing facilities that Medicare or private insurance isn't going to completely cover. Um, they may cover it full at first, but then after that, usually after 20 days, they're going to go to an 80% coverage and you're liable for the other 20%. This is going to cover that gap. There are even some provisions in there for limited long-term care stay, but again, it's not designed as long-term care insurance. So it's, it's going to run out pretty soon if you find yourself permanently in long-term care. Something to keep in mind as you consider the worth of such an investment. Hybrid life and long-term care, think of it the same way as you would consider whole life insurance versus term life insurance. It has and retains a financial value if it is not used. So what you're paying into is more of an investment than a backstop. Same thing kind of applies. I'm going to skip for a moment to annuities and what you are ultimately receiving in terms of either private annuities or more often annuities in the form of pension disbursements 
is going to go ahead and radically enhance above and beyond, say, Social Security, your monthly applied income, and hopefully stabilize how much is taken from your savings if you require additional care beyond simply aging in place. Finally, there is the reverse mortgage. What I will say about reverse mortgages is this. If, in fact, you are working with a reputable company and you own your property outright, all you are doing is creating a line of equity credit. Usually, that balance, in order to maintain the reverse mortgage, is as minimal as $100. That's it. You may never tap it. It's like having an emergency bank card from which you can go ahead and draw out payment that the bank will take first after your death and when that property is liquidated. Nothing more, nothing less. If you are living alone, it makes a lot more sense that if you are part of a couple or a family who share the same home. Ultimately, do your due diligence, talk to your Better Business Bureaus, talk to the Consumer Protection Finance Bureau, and talk to those family members and friends and members of your faith communities who have gone ahead and used these in the past. I neither endorse nor decry them. I simply say that if you treat it as a line of equity credit that is available to you, and it brings you peace of mind to set it up maintain a bare minimum balance and never touch it, God bless. But if you do need it for emergencies or for modifications that allow you to age in place, understand all you're doing is taking out equity, which based on the level of your savings and your monthly applied income, you can, continue, you can even start to pay back while you are alive just like a regular line of equity credit uh, it, it, it contains that contingency. Let me go ahead and skip past the slides that describe all of these in greater detail. And remember, you're going to get these slides to look at them in, in detail at your leisure and remind you of the resource tabs that are at the end of this presentation. These are going to be not just for research, they're also going to be for advocacy as you come to a better understanding as a consumer, what is most appropriate for you based on your medical condition and financial strength. Also, I mentioned references, many of which are going to come from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, they're going to come ultimately from some other states. Again, your mileage varies state by state in terms of what is covered, but understanding what the larger states comparable to Texas do may also give you a sense as to how to advocate perhaps in this state for change so that Texas resembles California, New York, Illinois, Florida, et cetera, when it comes to expanded coverage and what it can do for consumers in this state. And then, as I mentioned, Lisa Falkenberg um, has wonderful articles that you really need to look at. Yes, they're six years plus old, they're still relevant in terms of understanding the choice you make in insurance and how it ultimately impacts not just your quality of life in the moment, but down the road, whether you're dealing with a chronic condition or a condition that ultimately requires follow-up. If you need individual consultation, have further questions that we can help address or need help accessing more resources than what we have provided here today. Here are faces put to names for Dr. Dedemeyer and for myself. And we encourage you to reach out to us. Email is usually best in terms of scheduling with us um, because we do get rather busy, especially during the fall and spring. The summer is a little bit different. 
um, we encourage appointments in order to discuss whatever it is that we can assist you with. And ultimately, um, taking one quick peek here at the chat, can you share anything about the Texas Long-Term Care Partnership? No, I'm afraid, Sheila, I can't. Um, I, I would certainly encourage you to speak with the Area Agency on Aging um, and, and get their perspective. Uh, but ultimately, um, we, we, can, we're, we can certainly go ahead and talk about um, long-term care in general, but I can't talk about specific groups or organizations. But I encourage you to speak with a government agencies that are out there and that, more, more importantly, your tax dollars are paid for in order to go ahead and to uh, uh, get the information you're seeking. Um, and a reminder to everyone that, again, you registered, you get a recording, and you get a slide deck, and you are more than welcome to go ahead and to forward those to anyone you know and love. And, and in addition to that, uh, remember, if you go to hhci.org and you click on the Resources tab, many of you have been there and clicked on the Events tab in order to sign up for the Aging with Grace series or individual sessions within it. Uh, but, but the Resources tab is where you're going to find anything that we produce and record uh, in reverse chronological order. So ultimately, um, we are so grateful for you taking the time to be with us throughout this series. And again, should you need us for anything else, contact us directly by email. You certainly are welcome to call and leave voicemail, but when it comes to appointments or sharing information, that tends to be the best way for us to receive and respond. I hope that each and every one of you has as kind and as gentle a week as possible. God bless.